Well, what is up? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. My name is Mike Hickerson, and I am privileged and honored to be the lead pastor of Mission Church in Ventura, California. What is up? This is like family reunion for me, and you're like, that's weird because we don't know who you are. That's great, that's great. Wherever you're at on the campuses, wherever you're at online, um, outside, in the universe, I mean, real life is just taking over the world. Well done. I love, 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 love this church. Like, I'm privileged to be a part of this story. I met Rest, Rusty George when I was a senior in high school in 1995. He was way older than that. Um, so if you're doing math, that makes me 45. Congratulations on the math. That's great, really great. I would love to make fun of Rusty. I have plenty of ammo to make fun of Rusty. He has way more ammo to make fun of me, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But uh, as much as I would love to make fun of Rusty, I can't because I love this church. I love him. Uh, our church would not exist without the generosity of this church, without the way that this church has showed up and that continues to give. I mean, I love everything about it. This church has been so generous and is so generous. It shows up, it meets needs, probably in ways that you don't even quite understand behind the scenes. There were hundreds and hundreds of people that helped start Mission Church in Ventura, California. Not too long ago, I started thinking about my Lancaster fam, Scott. How are you? Uh, Scott was a volunteer, like hanging out as a volunteer and showing up in the theater when in Mission Ventura at 5 a.m. helping set up. I start thinking about friends who's the executive here. He was a volunteer. I started thinking about all the people like Connor, student pastor at the Valencia campus. Like he would basically literally help my family uh, unload boxes when, at our like town home in Ventura, California when we showed up. It's crazy like how generous this church has been. I love this church so much. Um, if you don't know, my wife's name is Jody. She's awesome. You, I'm so sorry. She's amazing. Um, you just get stuck with me today. So that's, that's fun. We've got three daughters. So uh, pray for me. That's a lot. I just need all the help that I can get, so please pray for me. I've got a 20-year-old daughter named Hayden. Uh, she's in college at Grand Canyon University. I've got a 17-year-old senior named Bryce, uh, and then I've got a 14-year-old freshman named Tyler. Yes, they have boy names. They're our daughters. You just have to get over that. Uh, we'll be fine. Um, it's good, but it's been a journey of our life, privilege of our life. When we moved to Plant Mission, those girls were in third grade kindergarten, two years old, and it's crazy to think that all that God has done and one of the things that we call a truce at the place that I get to lead and have the privilege to teach at is we call a truce because we really believe, man, that God is who he says he is and he will do everything that he's promised to do. So I wouldn't pretend to know your story or what you're walking in from, but what I do know is that there's a God who rescues and saves and that we exist as a church to help people find and follow Jesus. We try not to overcomplicate it. We try to lean in because it's pretty, uh, has big ramifications. If we really would give God a chance that he might be who he says he is and wants to do all that he's promised to do. And so I'm just gonna act like this is mission, so forgive me, everyone. And uh, so if I was teaching at mission, we were hanging out together, I would want you to know like, man, there, there's a really good God um, and there are no perfect people on this stage. There's no perfect people in this room. There's no perfect people online. I think you know that. So we would call a truce to say, like, let's just turn to people around us. If you're in a coffee shop watching this, maybe not do that because it's going to be weird. But if you're in the room, if you're watching this anywhere or online where you can talk to people and serve with people or uh, connect with people, just kind of look, look next to, look at them with kind eyes, look at them in the eye and just say, hey, I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I want you to know this. You are not Perfect. So just turn to the people next to you. Just tell them that. It's going to, and, and, and they're going to look back at you. They're going to get defensive and like, what are you talking about, sucker? How did you know? Like, they're going to bow up a little bit and be like, well, you're not perfect either. You know, those fights are going to break out everywhere. That's why you're not doing it in the coffee shop. That would be bad. Um, some of you enjoyed that way too much. So it's, it shouldn't be that enjoyable to remind people how imperfect that they are. Um, don't do this later. Like when you're trying to argue about lunch or dinner or why the kids are the way they are, don't remind each other of each other's imperfections later. That's not a great time to do that. It's a great time to do it though when we're the church together. To remind ourselves that there are no perfect people, none. But there's a really perfect God who rescues and saves. And he sent his son Jesus into the mess for the worst of us and the worst in us so that we would have the opportunity to be restored as much loved sons and daughters of God. And that single fact means that there is hope for every single one of us. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through, there's hope for all of us. Imperfect moral foul-ups. And that means that change is possible, that God loves us. He just want to, doesn't want to stay stuck in our hurts or habits or hang-ups, that he loves us enough and he's given us everything that we need to live the life that he's called us to. 
He's given us his presence. He's given us his son. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his word. He's given us each other as the church. I mean, we have everything that we need to live the life that God has called us to. And there's hope for us. And change is possible. And everyone is welcome. But, but I didn't like grow up in church. So I mean, if you're not a church person, like, like we're you're my people, all right? So I didn't, I just, you know, I was the one that, like, my mom told my grandma, told me to tell my grandma, like, that, that then lie. Like, just when we go to grandma's house, just say we go to church all the time. I'm like, okay, mom, I can do that. And I went to my grandma's church, and this is the first time I'd seen men in robes, and I didn't know what that was, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I grew up um, like, like that. I didn't have anything to do. Like, in my mind, ch- church was like robes and weird singing and donuts and orange juice and, like, like, kids' things. Like, I didn't really just grow up in church. I didn't know. And so I was like, my my mom and my stepdad, we moved to this suburb of Tulsa, Oklahoma at a place called Owasso, Oklahoma. And you know how, I mean, you, not you, other people, um, they want their kids to be more moral than they were. Um, And so that was my parents. They were like, well, he's a mess. He's already breaking into houses as an elementary kid. We maybe ought to figure something out for him. True story. Uh, We maybe ought to figure something out for him and we want him to be more moral than us. So like, what do we do? And my mom was like, well, my stepdad were like, well, there's a church that's got stuff going on. So we started attending church. And like, and I didn't, like, I didn't know what it was. And I was smart enough to figure it out a little bit later. Like the pastor came and visited our house. So when that happened, you know, and like asking us questions and asking me questions. And I didn't like grow up in church, but, and when I was in high school and middle school, my life was radically changed and set the trajectory in the course of my life. But it ha- got me thinking when I was younger, like, what is church? And you may be walking in and you're like, I don't know. It's just like the building and the thing we write checks to and it has an address and that's that thing. But what did Jesus have in mind when he thought up the word church? Like when he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I don't, I want to get to what Jesus had in mind because I know what I had in mind when I was a kid. And I know what a lot of my friends in Ventura County have in mind when they think of church and church people. It ain't good. Can we say that? Can we be honest together? I mean, what, what my friends think about when they think of church, they, they have this image of like Ned Flanders, that that's what church people are like, you know, like, you, oh, you know them too. That's great. Um, and, or they think it's like maybe the best description of what they, people think that church people is like is like Angela from The Office. It's like this hyper judgmental, super hypocritical, have opinion about everything and don't like anyone. You know Christians like that? If you don't and you're the weird uncle of the church family, I'm so sorry. There's hope for you too. That's all right. But or they think that there's like this street pe- preacher with a megaphone and that church and church people are all about one-way communication and yelling and screaming about everybody, about what they're doing wrong, and they seem to be glad that they're going there. That's what I think what comes to mind when we think about church. For sure what comes to mind, like when our friends think about church, or maybe it's this idea that Well, it's a believer church or a seeker church or a Bible church or a traditional church or community church or contemporary church or an expository church or a topical church or missional church or an attractional church or a Baptist church or a Lutheran church or Christian Christian church or Catholic church or Assembly God or EV Free, where you keep going down the line. That's what we come when we think about church. And what I found, and I love this quote, is that spirituality, I love the Dallas Willard quote, says spirituality wrongly understood or pursued is a major source of human misery and rebellion against God. Because when we get this idea of what God intended and we get a little bit off of our life of what he intended for us to be as the church, then it jacks us up. It messes us up. Because church has always been about the people and not the building. Let, Let me just be honest here. My grandma is the reason I'm a Christian, right? Or grandma and Jesus, all right? My grandma is the reason I'm a Christian, and she lied to me when I was a kid. And maybe your grandma did too. Love your grandma if she's sitting next to you. Just tell her I love her. Um, I love her. But she told me, my grandma said, here is the church, and here is the steeple, and you open up all the doors, and you see all the people. I'm like, grandma, it took me a while to figure out that you lied to me. Because this is not the church. We're not steeple things. The church is people thing. This is the church. So here is the church and here is the steeple. You open up the doors. That's the church where the people are. And we get that all messed up in what Jesus had in mind when he said the word church. And what Paul had in mind when he said the word church. And what Luke had in mind when he said the word church. And what Peter had in mind when he said the word church was always about the people of God being called out and rescued. The rescued sons and daughters set apart, not from anything we've done because we're all morally bankrupt. We've all blown it. We're all messed up. There are no perfect people, but we are rescued people. 
a saved people, a people that have hope. In fact, the word church or ecclesia that we would translate church is used about 114 times in the New Testament, and it's always been about the people. So what the church is, and we got to get this right, if we're going to be the church right, not just do the church right, we got to make sure we get this right, that the church is the people of God, partnering with him and his redemptive mission in the world. And you're like, yeah, of course that's what the church is. But we get so messed up with it. Because we get so jacked up in what we think the church is and isn't or what it's how it's supposed to serve us or what we're supposed to do as it. And again, if you're just hanging out and you're like, man, I'm just checking out Faith. I just, like, she invited me and she said we were going to get something to eat after this. So that's why I'm here. I says, you're in a locker room conversation right now. We can chat later about all that God has for you because, man, he rescues and saves and sets us on a path. And you have the right to become a much-loved rescued son or daughter and don't miss that opportunity. And I know that church people are weird sometimes. I am one. I understand that. And I know that you probably have met some weird Christians in your life. And if you haven't, you are one. And that's okay. We can still be a part of the family together. But what the church is, is the people of God. That's us. So we're family. We haven't met each other yet, but we're family. I love what, First Peter, what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, what we are as the people, we are not steeple things, we are people things as the church. Are we perfect people? No, not at all. Are we rescued people? Absolutely. Are we on mission, people? Absolutely. Are we rescued sons and daughters? Where our past is not held against us, our present makes sense, and our future has purpose and hope? Absolutely, that's who we are. We're a people partnering with him. It's his church. We're his people. It's his mission. It's his command. It's his rescue of us. It's his lordship that we're under. It's his authority that we come under. He rescues and saves, and we're partnering with him. Like one of the New Testament, like if you're flipping through your Bible or you're looking through your phone, one of the New Testament, when they start talking about like church, ecclesia, like Jesus is talking about it, and one of the ways that he refers to it is like his bride, like, like we're his people, like we, we belong to Jesus that way. And I don't know, I mean, whatever is important to Jesus is important to her, and whatever is important to her is important to him. I don't know if you met my wife. She's amazing. I'm totally biased. That's okay. I'm allowed to be biased about my wife. But like, let's just say like you really like me, and you don't really like her, you and I probably aren't gonna have the best relationship. And I know a lot of my friends, for lots of reasons that I don't have time to talk about, are trying to walk through why they would wanna deconstruct the church and what they don't like about it. And I'm just telling you, when you, if you were to nitpick my bride, if you were to nitpick my wife, if you were to talk about all of her worst traits, all the things about her that you don't like, you and I aren't going to have the best relationship. So when we realize that we as the people of God are partnering with Jesus, that we are part of Jesus's family, we are his thing. And so when we talk bad about other churches or we talk bad about other Christians, we're talking bad about people. And it's really hard to have a great relationship with the groom when you're talking bad about the bride. So we're his people, we're his rescued people. And we're not asking him just to bless us as his people. We are partnering with him and what he's doing in the world. That's what we get the privilege of in because it's his mission. It's his mission to rescue and save and create for himself a people. The church, get this, yes, we all have mission statements. My church's name is mission. Yes, we have a mission statement. All that stuff is great. Yes, like the church doesn't have a mission. The mission that we're all called to as the church has a church. Because it's God's mission way before the church existed that he was going to rescue and save for himself a people. So we're just a part of that mission. The mission, this is going to be complicated, the mission predates the church. It's like when you go to the airport, like, you know, if you go to LAX, LAX isn't just like, which is awesome airport. If you, just kidding. If you go to LAX, it would be wrong thinking to think that the airport is winning when all the planes are on the ground safe and clean at their gates. 
And sometimes we think that all the church is winning when all the people are at the thing, at the gate, and we can count everybody. But the airport exists, LAX exists, to get us to the destination that we're supposed to be going to. That's when we know it's winning. So the church exists to get us on the mission, not just to gather at the gate. And I'm pro things like gathering at the gate. I'm pro like having buildings. I'm pro all that. I'm not anti that. I'm not anti building. I'm just pro church more than I'm pro building because the church has always been about the people. And we exist to be on mission. And we tolerate the airport, barely, because it's getting us where we're supposed to be going. The church isn't the destination. It's a very important connector role. Jesus didn't pray. This is important. Jesus didn't pray, thy church come. And you're like, you didn't? I thought that was in there. That's all right. Sorry. What do you pray? Thy kingdom come. He didn't pray. I have come that they may have church and have it to the full. He didn't? I thought we were supposed to, like, I thought he grayed on a curve on attendance. I thought that's how it works. No, he prayed. No, I came that they may have life and have it to the full. So as the people of God, we're all about kingdom and his mission, and we're all about helping people experience the life that can only be found as a much-loved, rescued son or daughter. That's what the church is. But it's not just a holy huddle where we hang out and sing kumbaya and talk about how awesome we are, brother, sister. Man, it is what he's doing in the world where we live, work, and play, where things get messy, where it's not always up and to the right. See, a lot of us sometimes like to count who is here and how it's going and is it going up and to the right. Did you know when God's talking about his church and his mission that he's called us all to, he literally counts who's not here. Luke 15, amazing chapter of the Bible. If you had one chapter to read for the rest of your life about where Jesus talks about what God is like, the God that, you, that I wish that you knew is the God that Jesus knows. And Luke 15 is all about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And God seems to care a lot more about counting what's missing and going after it than he does to make sure that everybody's safe and secure in the circle. And I know that messes with us because we like the circle. And we like the people that are like us. And we love it when everybody is rescued. And we love it after people have had some time to be transformed from the inside out. And we love that. But that's not the mission. And that's not what we're called to. So we've got to figure out this shift for us as the church, as the people of God. That we've got to figure out like, that the church is a who. And not just a what. That we are the church. That we as the church, we need to figure out that we are not to be consumers of the church. We are consumed as the church because we are rescued sons and daughters on mission with what he's doing in the world. We're consumed with that. We obsess about that. We're not just attending church. You've heard this. We're being the church where we live, work, and play. I don't know. I just didn't get a lot out of church today. What do you mean? You are the people. You mean you didn't get a lot out of the people today? We are a church for each other and for the city. And this is not a new story. It's an old story. It just gets to be our lap and our turn. Let me walk through a little bit. In 42 AD, Mark goes to Egypt. In 49, Paul goes to Turkey. In 51, Paul goes to Greece. In 52, the apostle Thomas goes to India. In 54, the Paul goes on his third missionary journey. In 174, the first Christians are reported in Austria. 280 AD, the first rural churches emerge in northern Italy. For the first time, Christianity is not strictly urban. In 350 AD, 31.7 million or 53% of the Roman Empire claimed claimed Christ as Lord. In 432 AD, Patrick heads to Ireland, which we celebrate in March by pinching each other and getting smashed, right? You'll figure that out later. In 596, Gregory the Great sends Augustine and a team of missionaries to England to reintroduce the gospel. The missionaries go to Canterbury, and within two years, there are 1,000 people, 10,000 converts to Christianity. In 635, the first Christian missionaries arrive in China. In 740, Irish monks reach Iceland, and 900 missionaries reach Norway. By 1200, the Bible is now available in 22 different languages. In 1498, the first Christians are reported in Kenya. In 1501, Pope Alexander XI grants to the crown of Spain 
obtain all the new land in the discovered Americas on the condition provisions be made for the religious instruction of the natives. 1537, Pope Paul III orders that the Indians of the new world be brought to Christ by the preaching of the divine world and an example of a Christian life. In 1554, 1500 converts to Christianity are found in Thailand. In Thailand, 1671, Quaker missionaries arrive in the Carolinas. In 1720s and 30s, the Great Awakening happens where Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield take the gospel to as much as 80% of the colonists. In 1800s, Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody lead the Second Great Awakening. In the early to mid-1900s, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham changed the face of Christianity in America forever. In 1912, over in Van Nuys, California, 100 dedicated believers begin meeting in an old railroad car that becomes Shepherd of the Hills Church. In 1952, in that same region, Hillcrest Christian Church begins with 105 people. In 1995, God leads those churches to merge together. And what we know as Shepherd of the Hills Church right now, five years later, Shepherd of the Hills decides to plant a church in Valencia, California. And in October of 2000, the doors of Real Life Church open in Edwards Town Center Movie Theater. And 10 years later into the life of Real Church, Real Life Church, they wanted to plant a church the way that they were started and God arranged the circumstances. In 2011, Mission Church that I helped lead launches in Ventura, California. In 2018, Mission City uh, Church launches in Santa Barbara that both of our churches helped, helped launch and start. In 2019, Slow City Church starts in San Luis Obispo. In 2023, all of us will be helping plant a church together in Ojai. It's not a new idea. It's just our turn. This is the story that we're called to as the people of God on mission with God to help bring a watching world back to relationship with him as best that we can and as far as it depends on us. And that's why we have real hope. Not because the church is awesome, but because God is awesome and he rescues and saves. And his plan A is to establish lighthouses of hope all over the world where people that are rescued can turn into rescuers to help people know the privilege and joy that it is to be found by a loving God. And I don't know your story. And I don't know what you've been through. And I don't know what baggage you got or hurts or habits or hangups you got. But I would want you to know no matter who you are and what you believe about God, Jesus, Bible, church, Christians, I would want you to know this, that we have such great news. It's in 2 Corinthians, it says this, it says, for Christ, love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That's complicated, let's just keep going, you'll get it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Woo! The old is gone. The new is here. All that stuff and videotape from your past, all that stuff that you don't think that you'll ever be able to be made right again, God has made a way. He just doesn't make good people cleaned up. He makes dead people alive and new. The old is gone. The new is here. And all of this is from God who reconciled to, us, to himself through Christ and gave, us, gave all of us the ministry of reconciliation. That's important for us that that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's our job. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us in your neighborhood, in your school, on your teams, in your workplace, on the 405. On the five, I know those are hard places to be his ambassador, but it, like that's our job. And he's, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And this is one of my favorite verses in all the New Testament, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a good trade for us moral fallops in the room. But as the church, we are the people that he has rescued and called and sent out to be the church and what he's doing in the world. 
In my 20s, I was a student pastor. I'm a recovering student pastor. So I got demoted to be the lead pastor of a church plant. So I love, I love student ministry. And I've been privileged to work in the South and Midwest and seeing God do amazing things. I saw that the hope is real and tangible for firemen and farmers and truck drivers and stockbrokers and stay-at-home moms and rednecks and seminary graduates and people with secret lives and stagnant faith, for politicians and factory workers and self-righteous church leaders, for families, families that are falling apart or pretending they all together. So I, when we planted mission in 2011, I just was like, man, do it again, God, let's go. Like, I know that you're real. I've seen you work. You've rescued me. You've changed my life. You rescue and save. Do it again, God, was my prayer. Let's go. I had no idea what I was in for, that he would blow my mind of all that he's accomplished in people's lives. And it would break every box that I could have even comprehended that he would do. Walking through with my friends, former stripper turned prostitutes, addicts, desperate for help and hope, taking a risk that God is who he says he is and can be trusted, going to a place to get rescued and restored and not just be like cleaned up, but made new. Like my friend that was walking through that that life becoming like one of the most gracious, kind, like Christians that I know to this day. I start thinking about my friend like that was a mom that had a substance problem. She has manslaughter one night while she's under the influence. And the things that were said about her in my city and county on chat rooms, not a Christ follower. I saw her almost to the depths of despair. And then I saw God work a miracle and repentance and restoration and surrounding her with real, legit friends. I think about a friend of mine, one of the biggest distributors of porn on the West Coast, walking away literally from millions of dollars, restoring stuff as best he can, making amends as best he can, not because he found the crutch of religion, but because he found the hope in Jesus Christ. Is he perfect? No. But he is the most on fire when he's reaching people that he could possibly be. Think of my friend Mark, who was a contractor in town, and he was a Christian forever. Seen it all, done it all, done the church thing, I got it. And I'd rather spend my time at Nasi on the weekends because I'm just over it. And he was just bored by it all. And let me just tell you, if that's you in the room and you're bored by your Christian faith, then you're doing it wrong. Because we're supposed to be on mission with the world. And I watched Mark one of my good friends get lit up for the fact that he has a mission for his life that God rescues and saves and he has a world that he's supposed to after. He's an amazing man. I got stories of my friend like Tony who's my daughter's soccer coach and full on hidden addict. His brother had been murdered through some of the activities that hang out in Ventura. And I watch him get clean. I'm watching him be brave. I mean, he's talking to me about like, what does seminary mean? And what does that look like? Because I just want to, he's baptized more people this year than I have, guaranteed, at our church. Then I start thinking about my friend Glenn, and Glenn would, if you, he would scare all of you to death if he walked in here. Tattoo artist, mountain of a man, has that face like, I will end you, that kind of guy. But he's like, I wa- and he was like, grew up where he was like in a, a family of addicts where he had to take care of everybody. He ends up taking care of his brothers and sisters and living in a car homeless for a while. And he's kind of made his way, self-made, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, like tough dude. And I've watched him come to Christ and melt in tears in the baptistry. And I've watched his life completely change with joy and helping people find and follow Jesus. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've watched homeless friends come up out of the water, terminally ill, special needs, victims of rape, hell's angel bikers, kids with two moms, people counting days, cleans, and over and over, it's God's like saying, you think you've seen it all? You haven't seen nothing yet because of the good news that we have. And this is our story in this room as the church, not steeple people, but as people that God has invited into his mission and what he's doing in the world. My wife wrote this, and so I'll kind of wrap up a little bit with this. It says, I have wanted to be in, to be in the in crowd, in the loop, in the know, among the proud, not left out, but to be allowed to be in. 
and I have wanted to be in. Wear clothes that are in style, a trendsetter and versatile, just the right cut and a perfect smile, I have wanted to be in. To be looked as someone who has much, own the latest and greatest stuff and such, I have wanted to be in. But I have felt aggravated, frustrated, unappreciated, slated as someone who is underrated, unimportant, unknown, unseen, average, mediocre, routine, beneath, below, beyond a chance, inconsequential, insignificant. But Jesus met people like me took notice of a blind man and made him see, saw a locked up kid and set him free, told little Zacchaeus to get on down out of that tree, felt it when a desperate woman touched his cloak, kneeled beside a dead girl and up she woke, hung out with a down and out and broke, healed a crumpled man by a pool with just the words that he spoke. He touched a man with leprosy that others would mock. He touched the mouths of the mute and at once they could talk, forgave a woman at a well who was a laughing stock. He came to be the shepherd of a wandering flock. In the company of sinners... That's where he'd eat. Defended an adulterer, made her accusers retreat, made followers out of men who were crooked crooked sheets, let the tears of a prostitute anoint his feet. And suddenly, dramatically, miraculously, undeniably, they were in. In his story, in his truth, in his grace, in his purpose, in his eyes, someone great. And I have wanted to be in. And since the day I met with him, he took all that I have been, all my fear, my shame, my sin, and changed my life by letting me in. And that's our mission as the church, as the people that are in on the rescue, that we're partnering with him, what he wants to do in the world. And that's where real hope is found. Because there's real pain and real mess out. So those of us that are in gotta go out to extend real hope. I don't know your story. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're walking through. But I do know that God is who he says he is and he can be trusted and he sent his son Jesus into the mess to rescue and save and give us a mission. Don't miss it. Why don't you pray with me? God, you are good and you are great. And we aren't, but you are. And we need you because we just get so distracted and so selfish and so um, thinking of everything else but you and your kingdom and what you're up to. Forgive us of that, God. Thanks for not like shaming us into obedience of you, but loving us into obedience of you. May we be a men and women and kids and students that live out the privilege of the calling we've received as much loved sons and daughters of the Most High God. That we would be your ambassadors as if you were making your appeal to a world through us. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.